All right. Well, I guess I'll get started. Um, I assume we're into midterms and stuff now, or yeah. Yeah. okay. Explain shrinking class size. Hopefully, it comes back up. Uh, so this lecture, uh, I'll be talking a little bit about navigational techniques you can use in your robot. So this is going to cover quite a few, um, quite a few different things. It'll be kind of a quick overview. So uh, the lab on Monday, you'll experiment a bit with one of these sensors. Uh, but of course, there'll be lots of time to try different ones if you want. Um, and some of this is just general overview. You might not need it for this exact robot, uh, but it's good to know about how to solve some of these problems. Uh, so I'll be covering sort of what is uh, navigation, the background of it, um, some of the initial types used, so dead reckoning uh, is one that you'll probably use a lot in your robot. Uh, I'll talk about inertial measurements, so this is one of the chip sensors you have in your kit can do some of these inertial measurements, um, as well as using a compass, and again one of the chips in the kit has this ability to do compassing measurements. Uh, how we sort of combine measurements uh, using different filtering techniques and overall navigational algorithms for getting your robot to a goal or somewhere you want it. So when we talk about navigation, the fundamental problem is where should we go? So we don't, <coughs> we might not know where we are. You know, you, <coughs> you, can, you can break this down in a lot of ways. You can say, do we need a map? Do we need to know where the goal is? Do we need to know where we can't go? Um, but at the end of the day, your robot is asking the question, what should I do next? Should I go forward? Should I go left? Right? How far should I go? Something like that. Um, so to break that down, there's a lot of objectives you could sort of bring out of this. So one of the things is, what is the objective of your robot? Um, if you have a light-seeking robot, for example, you would say, you know, drive towards light. Uh, if you have some objective, like in this course, there's a goal. So you might say this is drive towards light. So that's going to mean um, you need you know, light sensors, you need an ability to detect which side the light's on of your robot. Um, you then might say, well, if that's our objective, do we have limitations? Uh, so is there obstacles in the way of getting directly to the light? Um, in which case we have to you know, ask the question, where can we go, even though we, need, we already know where we want to go. We want to drive towards the light. Um, it might be that the objective of this robot is just to explore. So if you're trying to generate a map of a place, uh, you want the robot to go everywhere. And the question is, where hasn't it been? Uh, it needs to go in any, any locations it hasn't explored. Um, and part of that might be answering the question of where we are. And again, this is all, it depends if the robot needs this or not. If you're just doing light sensing, you don't care about having a map of the whole system that you're you know, trying to make a perfect map of and then navigate through, you're just saying drive towards light. Uh, if there's something in the way, go around it. For more advanced tasks, like possibly the tasks you're gonna be doing, you may want to look into having a simple map at least. Um, so I'll talk about some methods of representing that map in your microcontroller. I sort of wanted to give a really very super brief history of navigation. This is more just some interesting points of uh, how long it took us to get to the point we are now where you know you have GPS everywhere and you know exactly where you are at all times uh, but you still get lost. Uh, so the beginning of this obviously navigating the oceans was um, a large problem requiring very good positioning on the earth because you can, you know, if you're in the middle of the ocean, knowing which way to go is very critical to figuring out which way is the closest way to land. Uh, if you're trying to visit North versus South America, um, it's very easy for a tiny bit of error to add up and put you in the wrong spot. Uh, so when we talk about navigation on the Earth, uh, we'll be talking about longitude and latitude. Uh, just for a reference, so this line here is what's known as a line of constant longitude. Um, and the other line going around the equator would be lines of constant latitude. So everywhere on this lot, latitude is the same uh, latitude. Everywhere on this other line would be the same longitude. Um, so figuring out your rough location, uh, figuring out your latitude is possible using uh, stars or the sun. So this is sort of some of the really early instruments for it. Um, so there's an example from like 1645 of a mariner's astrolab. And this would help you find your, um, your latitude. And again, this is where you are sort of north to south um, on the earth. So where you are on this line. Because once you fix your position on that line, you have the, 
this same uh, lines of latitude go around the Earth. Um, so that you can fix with uh, the location of the stars or sun in the sky. So it's not an impossible problem to solve. The more difficult problem is uh, longitude. So if we know, going back to our Earth here, you know, we can know that we're somewhere, erase this stuff, we're somewhere on this line of constant latitude here. However, we have no idea you know, if we're here, um, part way across the ocean, we have no idea if we're right here, just off the coast. Um, it is a very difficult problem to solve. Why this is such a difficult problem is that uh, the Earth is rotating and it rotates at a fixed rate. So if you try to use, you know, a reference, remove all this stuff. So if you try to use some external reference over here, like a, a star, um, the location of that star in the sky or sun in the sky, whatever it is, is going to be moving uh, as the Earth rotates. If you have no idea about the, the current time, you have no way to fix what the longitude is. Um, because you know you can take a measurement here, it'll be at one position in the sky. Uh, later on, there's sort of two possible things that can happen. Either the Earth could rotate and it shifts in the sky, or you could be somewhere else on the line and it would also shift in the sky. Um, you have to answer one of those questions. Did I move or did the Earth rotate? So knowing the time, uh, having an accurate timekeeper lets you answer the question, did the Earth rotate and how much is it rotating? Um, once we know that solution, we can then say, you know, the only way that we can observe some star in the sky at that location based on the time um, is if, you know, I'm at this one location here. So that's the navigational solution. And that's where I am. So I now have a better idea. You know, this is all still fairly rough by today's standards. Um, but it would at least give us the longitude and latitude for uh, getting your position on the Earth as a ship. Uh, it's not a lot easier navigating by air. So this is uh, 1927, I think, the Spirit of St. Louis. Uh, so this was a flight from, do I have a map? No, I don't. Uh, this was a flight from New York to Paris, and that was the first cross. And there was a big prize put up to, uh, for whoever could navigate from New York to Paris. This flight was about 33 hours, I think, something like that. Um, he did it all by himself, so just him awake for 33 hours, hoping he could stay awake and successfully navigate. And he more or less managed to make it there, uh, using basically just a compass and a system called dead reckoning, which is uh, where you start at a given point, and based on how far you've flown and the, uh, your compass headings, you just add up the points. So we'll talk about using dead reckoning in a robot. Uh, but even he, for example, had a note that uh, on an earlier flight, when he was flying down in so somewhere, um, going over Florida, that his, uh, his compass failed, just started rotating. And uh, basically because he, the fog sort of lifted, lifted, he was able to navigate. And it was more or less just luck. So there was a lot of sort of just luck in this early stages of uh, navigation by air. And there's a number of these other people attempting this flight that either uh, didn't make it unknown what happened to them, and a few other people tried afterwards, and they made it, but they did a pretty bad job of navigating, so they ended up you know, way off course and had to fly over to the final location. Um, so it's sort of interesting, the earlier, uh, the, or the beginnings of this navigational problem. Uh, and then nowadays, of course, we have GPS, which makes it a lot easier to get a fix anywhere in the world. Uh, but of course, that's something you don't, can't use in your robot for two reasons. You don't have a GPS receiver on it, and the other is, of course, GPS uh, has a lot of trouble working indoors, so you would, wouldn't be able to use it in the gym. So that's going to leave us with some other sensor options when it comes to navigating. Um, and when you use the sensors, one way you can use them is this dead reckoning system. Um, and really, basically, it's just we start at some known point, and we have measurements of how far we've traveled. And it's always based on our own, uh, you know, our own measurements we're making. Uh, and it almost always involves what we're calling integration. And uh, integration in this uh, context just means, you know, very basically doing the addition of how far we've traveled. Uh, so if you know your velocity, integrate that to get your position. 
Uh, you know, if you have a distance traveled in a car, you could just multiply, if you have a constant velocity, the time you've spent, uh, multiplied by your, uh, the speed of the car to get you the distance traveled. Uh, so obviously if we, you know, if we start at a known point here, all we're gonna say is assuming our initial point reference is accurate, or we might not care where it is, we just have everything relative to this point. Um, so this is the case in your robot. Your map, your entire world is relative to that starting point, which you know on the map you'll be given. Uh, and you can just say, you know, if I traveled forward, oops, two meters, and then I turn left 90 degrees, and then I go up one meter. Um, this is where I estimate my final position is. So we're simply counting how far we've gone uh, one direction, if we've made any turns, and how far we've gone the other direction. So this is a really uh, basic sort of, this is a basic system you'll probably be using entirely in your robot. Uh, but it can be made fairly accurate. The only real core problem is that if your measurements themselves are not very accurate, all of your errors are never going to be fixed. Uh, so going back to this one, if you actually traveled 2.1 meters here uh, instead of 2 meters, you'll, you'll never be able to fix that in the future. So then in the future you say, you know, I go this way, I go that way, I go this way, I go up, over, down. Um, and your position will always be out by whatever the addition of the error terms in each, um, each time you measure that. So if it was some very constant offset and you go forward and backwards, it might cancel out to some degree. Uh, more likely what's going to happen is there's just a lot of noise and so they'll add in a kind of random walk fashion here. Um, but the point is, that's the main problem with dead reckoning is that if you do this for a long time, there's no outside reference that you know, fixes the, the errors in your uh, summation here. And that's what you really want ideally, is you want to use dead reckoning to get you somewhere and then say, am I where I think I am? If not, I need to fix that. Uh, as an it sort of example, probably the earliest example I know of, of dead reckoning, um, this is around the sixth century. Uh, so in China, they had these, what, they call them south pointers. Um, so originally people thought maybe it was some form of compass, but Eventually what they figured out is there's this system that has sort of a differential drive on the gears, uh, and it's designed such that if they started out pointing south, um, which they would do just using the sun, anytime you rotate this chariot, it'll do the opposite rotation on the, uh, the pointer, and they would literally just take this with them on long trips, and if it's cloudy out or foggy, they know where south is still based on where the, this guy is pointing. And uh, of course, this is going to add a lot of, it's all this you know, mechanical system going over roads where things can slip. Uh, so over long trips, I'm sure, it became inaccurate, but they could always recalibrate it once they saw the sun again. Uh, but this is sort of the earliest example I know of of something using dead reckoning for this type of navigational problem. Uh, so it's been well known that you can do this type of thing for a long time. Um, but sometimes it's really the only solution. So before there was a lot of knowledge about magnetic compasses, uh, this was what they came up with, and it's the best they could get at the time. So on your, your <coughs> robot, I briefly mentioned this on last Thursday, I think. The main method of doing dead reckoning will be these wheel encoder systems. Um, so there's a, oops. You're given these uh, IR infrared transmitter receiver slots. Um, so there's an LED in one side here. I don't know which side it is. And then the phototransistor on this side. Um, and you can make a wheel that goes between these two and every time uh, you get a slot in that wheel, it'll interrupt this uh, light or let the light through, whichever way you want to think about it. Um, and this will give you a number of pulses. So if you have the output, you know, you'll get a pulse every time there's a slot here. Um, and you can basically figure out what's the calibration between how many pulses are there in a rotation of this main wheel. Uh, based on that, I can figure out how far my rot robot's gone. So 
To use this, there'll be a few things to do. There's, uh, you need to select the resistor values for the optical device. So they give you a little board with that all mounted on it, but you need to uh, figure out what the resistor values are. So you would have done that a bit in the lab um, to sort of see how that works. You need to interface the pulse output to the AVR, so putting that output to a digital pin, um, and then doing the actual counting. So there's a few different ways to do the counting. Uh, you can use a timer to do it automatically. You can just pull every so often. Um, you can use interrupts, it's sort of up to you to explore a bit on that. And the only other thing you'll need is to calibrate out, uh, you know, what the errors are. So the two ways to do this is, oops, um, you could sort of calculate all these things. So you know the diameter of the robot wheels. Um, and you know, you know, if you select, your, there's a disc on the other side of this that has so many pulses. You could say, okay, well, I'll get 10 pulses or whatever it is you happen to design per revolution. Um, I know this means that the outer robot wheel itself has gone a certain number of revolutions. Um, based on the diameter, I can figure out the circumference and then say that's how far you know, the robot's going to move. That's one method. An easier method uh, that's sort of more common in engineering practice is simply to calibrate out everything. The problem with this is there could be errors in your wheel diameter. Uh, the wheels are a little squishy, so you might measure them. And then when you put the robot down, uh, they squish down a bit. So a nicer way to do that is just have your robot drive a little bit, a very specific known distance. Um, and then count how many pulses there were. So if that was, you know, 10 pulses, um, you can then just simply divide out the two to figure out one pulse is equal to however many centimeters. Um, when you do this, the nicer thing to do, though, is make this calibration distance as long as possible. Uh, this will reduce the amount of error. So obviously if you if you took this to the limit, if you just had your robot drive, you know, 10 centimeters, it might only pulse, have one or two pulses. Uh, and you don't really know, is one pulse, you know, seven centimeters? Is one pulse five centimeters? Was it eight? Uh, so you want this calibration distance to be as, you know, long as reasonably possible, such that you get a, um, a much better measurement of what one pulse means. You know, so maybe this is now, well, what did I say? 40 pulses. Maybe it's 41 pulses, because the previous one, you know, wasn't quite accurate enough. I only just got 10, There's, you know, one just on the verge of it. Um, but now I have a less error as I have more pulses to uh, do this calibration over. There's still sources of error, so it seems, you know, like, oh, maybe this is a perfect thing. Uh, but there's a few problems. One is that uh, the robot wheels could move uh, or the robot could move without the wheels rotating. So if there's any big inclines in the course, which there isn't, uh, it could slip on them badly, and you wouldn't know that. It's possible, for example, though, if you're driving over, you know, there's a little bump, uh, you're going over the coins and there's a screw on them or something. Uh, if one of your wheels jams for even a few seconds, your robot could become tilted. So if, you know, you have your two wheels, or you, perhaps you just catch the edge of, a, uh, of an object here. So just a tiny, tiny bit hits. Um, and you won't know that, in fact, you know, the wheel was spinning, but the robot wasn't going forward. It was uh, churning. So this is one of, one of the problems where you get these uh, sources of errors. Uh, of course, there's things like the, the calibration data. If you did that incorrectly, so your cal uh, calibration data wasn't accurate, you're not going to get uh, accurate measurements and accurate uh, final distances. As well as the wheel diameter will change slightly, which basically affects your calibration data. And this is a game they're squishy. So if you did this without the robot loaded at all, um, you put a bunch of batteries on it and it squishes down a bit or something like that. Uh, that could be another source of error for you. Um, this type of changing wheel diameter, you see that too in cars a lot. So if you've ever had a car or if someone changes the wheel size in the car, all of a sudden the speedometer as well as the odometer won't be accurate because they're all calibrated based on, you know, some diameter wheels, someone makes them smaller or bigger, and uh, can be off 10% or so. So that's, a, that's an error you'll also see in real life too. All right, questions on that stuff before I move on to the inertial? 
Okay. Okay, so inertial measurements. So inertial measurements are always going to close these. So inertial measurements are measurements that we feel we have no external reference for. Um, so they're forces that we have a system that doesn't, you know, isn't looking at external landmarks or using external signals to figure out where we are. You know, there's a lot of scenes in movies where some guy's blindfolded and thrown in a van, uh, and the van drives around, and then he says, like, oh, I could feel those bumps, or I knew how far I was going. That's kind of an example of uh, inertial measurement because you can feel, you know, you can feel the turns, you can feel the accelerations. Uh, so you have some idea of what your directions might be. Now this obviously in real life isn't very accurate. Uh, so instead we use two types of uh, measurement systems. And to use these, uh, we use, we do two things. We either measure acceleration uh, is one and angular velocity will be the other. Uh, so acceleration is useful to us for a few reasons. One, uh, there's always a gravity vector that points downward. So this is the acceleration, you know, when you're dropping stuff. Uh, you can measure that acceleration with these sensors. And what this measurement gives you is it tells you what direction is down in an absolute sense. Uh, so if your robot is going to be climbing or you want to detect it falling over, uh, you can use this. The other thing is you, of course, get acceleration due to movement. So as your robot will you know, go forward, if it's at rest, goes forward, there'll be a big acceleration spike as it speeds up. Uh, there's also, the other thing you can use it for, of course, is detecting bumps. I don't know if I have that on the next slide. Uh, so if your robot go, drives over something or drives into something, there'll be a big uh, spike of acceleration as it you know, accelerates either away from something or into something and stops suddenly. Um, most of these sensors internally have some principle like this. Uh, the ones you'll be using are you know, very tiny. They're MEMS devices, they're called, which basically integrates this onto a substrate, uh, just like a chip. Older systems would be physically larger devices that do this, that have a physical mass and some sort of spring and dampener. Um, so you can really see all it is is this mass is suspended by a spring. Um, draw this over here. Uh, so you, it would stretch down a certain amount. As you accelerate, if you accelerate down, the mass will move up. If you accelerate up, the mass would pull down. Um, and there's always going to be naturally some pull on that mass because of gravity, if it's uh, pointing this direction. <coughs> so that would just be a one-axis accelerometer that's measuring uh, you know, only up or down, or whatever direction it's facing. Uh, in your kit, we have what are called three-axis accelerometers. Um, the, depending how you define the axes is somewhat up to you. In your case, your accelerometer has a definition uh, that you can look in the data sheet that says, this is what I call Z, this is what I call X, this is what I call Y. Um, so in this example here, if you were holding your phone, you know, so it looks as it, as it does, um, normally there would be you know, this negative 9.8 meter per second squared in the y direction, um, and this is because they've defined y to be down. More common is z would be down. Again, it depends how you rotate it. Um, and then if you move your phone you know, forward or backward, you get a z plus or z minus, or x plus or x minus acceleration. Uh, when, when we tilt the device, we start to see a mapping of the gravity vector. So uh, what this means is that if we have our idea of the phone, um, let me just switch to this. Get that work. Uh, so if we have our phone, uh, what we have is we have the three axes. Um, you know, we have, let's say, our robot here. And in this case, I'm going to be looking at uh, the robot dead in. So we have Z will be down. X is here, and then Y is going to be out of the page, so you won't really see that. Uh, you can't see that in this figure here. But in this case, uh, we would have, if you did the measurements, you would have, you know, Z equals minus 
meters per second, y is equal to zero, x is equal to zero. Um, and as you tilt this device, what you'll see is the, uh, the gravity vector will no longer just be in a single one of these axes, but will be mapped into either two or all three of them. Um, so based on that, we can actually determine the tilt of the device. So I'll talk about that more when I show you interfacing to the sensor itself. Uh, it's a pretty easy calculation to do, but I'll skip that for now because we're going to see it again later on. So it's important to realize, though, that there's a lot of things it cannot detect. Um, most critically is that uh, if the, the gravity vector is you know, in always pointing down, uh, it can't detect changes in the heading. So as your robot rotates, uh, the, this will always, you know, as long as it's facing down, it doesn't matter because the other two axes are detecting zero acceleration. Um, it's impossible for it to detect changes in the heading which is to say it rotates, uh, your accelerometer cannot detect that rotation of the robot. Um, so it's useless for that. All it can detect is what are we calling roll and pitch, Oops. which is uh, rotation. So if you had the three axes, uh, either roll or pitch this way it can detect. So as it basically tilts in either axis, uh, it cannot detect changes in the heading, so as it rotates around. The other problem with using uh, accelerometers and actual inertial measurement units is if we want to physically detect, if we want to say, okay, well, how far has this block moved this way? Um, you know, this is something that planes and things like that do need to use and have used historically. And what we actually do is we double integrate each of the accelerations. Uh, when we integrate the acceleration once, it gives us velocity. When we integrate it again, it gives us the uh, position. So double integrate of Z, so each of these. Uh, of course now, any error in the acceleration is going to be uh, accumulated twice, so it's gonna be made even worse. Uh, this means we need fairly accurate acce accelerometers. Um, and the other tricky issue is we also need to delete out this uh, gravity vector. Um, obviously if you just you always have this constant gravity vector there, but you're not actually moving. That's just the pull of gravity. Uh, so you need to be able to remove that to determine what is your acceleration just due to your movement. Uh, once you determine the acceleration due to your movement, uh, you can do this integration and actually determine your position. The accelerometers you have in your kits are not remotely accurate enough to do this. So you can try playing around with it a bit, um, but you can really only use them for doing tilt and roll detection. They, they simply can't be used for this without a lot of work uh, removing the errors, and even then, it's only gonna be accurate for you know, a few seconds, maybe a minute if you're very, very good. Uh, but I would be surprised to have anything beyond that. All right, questions on the acceleration part before I move? Okay. Uh, so the other thing to detect is the angular rate, um, and this is what gyros are used for. So the angular rate is just, you know, how fast, in this case, the wheel is spinning um, in one, one direction or another. Uh, so in your case, what you're looking at is how fast is my robot moving, you know, as it moves around, a, uh, as it turns, or if it was an aircraft, as it pitches or rolls. Um, and actually, the other reason it shows this spinning wheel is historic or physically, the way to measure the angular rate is to use the gyroscopic effect, which is if you ever have a spinning wheel, um, they always say like if you've ever hold a, held a bicycle tire like this, and I don't know anyone who's actually just held it like this and spun it. So it's not a very good practical example. Uh, but if you try to rotate it, it's going to resist uh, your rotation. And we use that force to actually measure um, how fast we're trying to rotate the, the spinning disc, which is the gyroscope. Um, so it's always gonna wanna stay in one plane and you're trying to rotate it so you can measure that force that it's resisting with, um, is one way. The other way is that you can in fact have a gimbal, which I'll talk about in a second, such that it always maintains a constant um, plane and then you measure the difference between whatever the plane is that it's made, it, it has and you know your aircraft or something else around it. 
Um, we're going to be using, depending what you, what you find, you'll normally see the uh, rotational units being in degrees per second or radians per second. Um, if you don't remember, so uh, what 2 pi radians is equal to 360 degrees. <coughs> Um, so you can easily convert between the two wherever you run into them. It just seems to depend uh, which, you know, who prefers what in the data sheets you look at. I don't know if there's a more common thing. Uh, overall, degrees per second is used in the data sheet of the uh, gyros in your kit, but you will see radians per second, and we have to use radians per second as the math functions in the AVR microcontrollers are all in radians. Um, so you just have to look out for, you know, where do you need to convert units. Um, so the idea of a gimbal, this is sort of what I was talking about. Uh, if we have a gyroscope, this spinning uh, disc here, you also obviously need motors and stuff to cause it to spin. But the very basic principle of it is that if I have this, um, these three rings, which is the gimbal, uh, I can rotate the outer ring and that gyroscope is going to stay perfectly level or it wants to stay perfectly level. So as long as there's no friction in the gimbal, it will. Uh, so the ability to measure our position and uh, how we're rotating, oops, in that case can be done directly through the gimbal because we can measure the, uh, the angle between you know, whichever any of these axes and that gyroscope, uh, which will always maintain a level uh, wherever, in whatever orientation it started spinning. So as long as we know the original orientation of it, it gives us the ability to um, make very accurate long-term measurements. And these sort of gimbaled systems were used and uh, are still used for some drivers even, um, but this is from a French uh, medium or long-range missile, I think. Um, so you can sort of see this inner thing here. Um, is actually, and that's where the gyros are packed in that, and you can see some of the gimbals here, so you sort of see how there's a, these different rings uh, that can rotate within the, within the sphere. So they look kind of cool because they have this like sphere look to them, and uh, here's another one from a, the Peacekeeper ICBM. Uh, so this is the gyro, uh, and I don't know if it's the whole inertial measurement system or just the gyro. Uh, but you can see, you know, you have this one ball and you can see some of these concentric rings here um, and right at the corner. These are the connections of the gimbal. You can just kind of see the, uh, the shafts going into it. Uh, so it's doing the exact same idea. There's gyroscopes back in there and the gimbal allows it to rotate freely um, as the missile rolls or does anything like that. Um, so these are older. Yeah, these are older sort of uh, mechanical gyros. Uh, now what we would use is uh, this on the left. This is an LN200 IMU. Um, so in here, these are fiber optic coils and it's what's called a fiber optic gyro and it actually uses that um, to determine, and there's three of them, you can only see two of them here, but one for each axis uh, to determine the rotational rate. So this is uh, something, you know, this is the same thing as that little board you have. So this is in your kit. Um, this, you know, has three gyros and three accelerometers. Um, this also has three gyros and three accelerometers. So there's some differences between the two. Um, this one is like $30,000 plus US dollar. This one is $10. Um, one of them I can just buy off like eBay and AliExpress, one of them I can't. And uh, one of them I would go to jail if I took it across the border because it's controlled goods. And the reason it's controlled goods is they use these, you can use these in missiles. Uh, so they're more than accurate enough to keep very accurate long term, um, you know, over hours or days even. To do this sort of, I talk about this double integration here. Um, they're accurate enough that even when you do this double integration, uh, you can still maintain, you know, a few meters, tens of meters of accuracy of your position using only changes in acceleration. Um, and same thing for angular rate, using, you know, only changes in angular rate, I'm able to integrate it and accurately determine where I am in the world. Um, so to compare the spec sheets, they say, for example, the gyro uh, is going to drift 
about one to three degrees per hour. Um, so that means that if I have it sitting here on my desk and you know it's rotating around in any axis I want, um, at the end of that, my, the accuracy will be about one degree, you know, if I've done this for an hour, done this integration, um, I'll be more or less right within one degree. Uh, you can compare that to the, so you, your little device here um, says the initial tolerance on the zero rate, so zero rate being it's not moving, and it says it is moving, so that gives you some idea of the error, is around 20 degrees per second. Um, so in one second, it might be 20 degrees off in where it says it is in the world. Uh, you can calibrate, so you can use some uh, information to calibrate this out to improve the heading quite a bit. But at the end of the day, after about you know, 30 seconds or so, uh, your heading is gonna be so far off that it's almost useless. And this is the problem with these small uh, MEMS devices is that they are much more difficult to get accurate information out of you basically can't use them alone. So the, this inertial measurement system here uh, could be used alone to guide something to whatever the target is. Um, this basically cannot be used on its own. And when I say on its own, I mean without uh, fixing the information ever so often. In real life, this means you know, fixing it by getting GPS fixes to uh, correct your measurements. Uh, it could be you use landmarks. So in your course, you'll have the ability to um, detect certain landmarks and say, okay, I know where I actually am, so let me fix my measurements. Um, and when, so I talked earlier about the, I don't know where that was. Um, there's differences, you know, you just have to look in the spec sheet for what the uh, axis definitions are. So on the spec sheet here somewhere, it tells you, you know, if you take your gyro uh, slash accelerometer um, and you rotate it in one direction, so if I rotate it this way, um, it's going to read that as a positive Y uh, gyro movement. Uh, so we'll sort of see that, I'll play around with one here um, after the lecture so you can get an idea of what the measurements look like. Um, and yeah, I'll skip the example of the readings because I don't have a USB hub so I have to unplug the microphone. Uh, so when you're giving the readings, one thing I mentioned is that we can, um, we can calculate what the, the pitch and roll is uh, of the device. So to do this, this is sort of an idea of what the, the C code would look like. Um, and it's actually pretty straightforward. So let me to show you where these come from. Um, I'll take a copy of that. Um, and all this is, is that if we're, we have two, uh, two measurements, so we have the pitch and the roll. So looking at the pitch first, oops. Uh, all we're doing is we're we're saying, well, a few things. First of all, um, we have our three axes here. So we have Z, X, and Y. Um, and I have like, these variable Y squared, acceleration, and Z squared. So we can consider, I'll just call it Z, Excel, Y, Excel, X, Excel. Um, so we know a few things. We know that if there is no acceleration in the Y and Z, um, then we're entirely pointed straight up. So if the only, if the vector is entirely in the z-axis, um, really it would be negative. Let me switch the color here. Um, so if this was our acceleration vector, um, it's entirely in the z-axis, therefore uh, the pitch, I'm going to say is just straight up. Um, and we can do the same thing for the roll. Uh, so if the, for the roll, if the, it's entirely in the Y axis, um, which means our device has rolled over such that the vector is, either, is this direction, um, we would know that it's entirely you know, directly on its side because we've gone from this 
and we've got 90 degrees to the ground. Um, and here we're using radians again, so that's why you see this m pi over 2. Uh, for everything else, all we're going to do is use the arctan. Oops. Delete just that. Um, so if we have some other vector, so say it's like this, and this vector is going to be a combination of, you know, it could be entirely in one direction. Um, it could be more likely is that involves come on more likely is that uh, it involves a combination of x and y Let me redraw this here Y, Z, see that? Um, and if I get a vector somewhere, and we can see, basically we, we're gonna ask what's the components in the X, um, the Y, and the Z to give us our final vector. Um, and then it's these angles that we're gonna solve for within this. Um, so we can basically solve for a combination of I draw this uh, a combination of the angle upwards and the angle over um, and this will make more sense when you see the sensor readings running afterwards because you'll be able to see um, where how it affects each of the X Y and Z as I say I don't want to unplug the microphone so I'm gonna do that afterwards um, and we can do the same thing, uh, calculating the magnetic sensor, taking the magnetic sensor readings and turning them into a compass. Um, basically, with the magnetic sensor, we have the issue that, you know, if we had the X and Y, uh, you'll get a vector in between the two. And all we need to do is figure out the heading, which is effectively what this, um, uh, what this angle is. And again, you just break the components down into based on a certain amount of X, a certain amount of Y, um, and use whatever it is, arc sine or something, to figure out what the heading angle here is. Um, all of this stuff will be sort of more in the lab on Monday you'll do. Um, so I'm just giving a really brief overview of the principles behind it. Um, same thing with tilt compensation. That'll be for the lab on Monday. So I'll skip that. Um, so the other method you can use with your, your robot is landmark-based navigation. Uh, landmark-based navigation is where you simply say, I know where I am um, based on some you know, reference that I can view. Uh, so if you're on Spring Garden Road, you can say, hey, there's the new library. Um, I know where I am. I don't have a, you know, a GPS, I don't have a map, I don't have anything like that. Um, and this is a, this can be really useful for your robot because you have, somewhere, where is it? You know, you have a map of the course and there's various things you could say you, I want to use as landmarks. Um, there'll be these buttons with lights above them would be good landmarks. Uh, you can easy, even use stuff like why if I have a starting position, I'm going to find that corner um, of a wall and use that as a landmark. Uh, I can use the flag as a landmark, again, because it has some of these a combination of lights and these metal strips around it that'll make it somewhat unique to find. Um, any of these landmarks are just a way to uh, fix yourself within a map. Um, yeah, so using the landmarks in your robot, um, it might be that you just drive right to it and you know exactly where you are. Uh, alternatively, you can measure the distance to the landmark. So if I have a landmark here, a robot here um, and I can say what's the distance between you know that landmark and my robot the problem is that with just one landmark you know if I know this distance is five meters um, I could really be five meters I could be over here uh, if there's no directional ability and say well actually this would also be a solution uh, so to improve that you would need a second landmark 
Um, with the second landmark, you can say, you know, I'm five meters to this landmark and three meters to this landmark. Um, in that case, you only have two possible solutions. So it's also possible that you're over here uh, is the other issue. So you have one landmark, uh, two landmarks, and it gives you the two solutions. To solve that, you either need a third landmark. Um, so you could act then say, I'm also, you know, one meter from this landmark. And we had that five meters still, three meters. Um, in that case, there's an additional circle, and there's the intersection of all three circles, there's only one solution to. Uh, the other, that's sort of one way to solve it. The other way to solve it is just to disregard one of these two solutions. Um, so if I start here, you know, if I knew I started up here um, and then drove a certain distance, I could say, well, I know I'm at this solution to the problem, it's, and I can throw away the other one. Um, or it could be the other solution is outside of the course, so you can throw that away. But if you want to use landmark-based navigation, you should have two to sort of get yourself a fix if you're doing a distance-based solution. Um, if you simply drive to you know, any of these landmarks here, you could know exactly where you are in the course without needing this, um, this solution. All right. Combining measurements. So the other thing, uh, that you can use, and this combining of measurements goes back a little bit to these uh, inertial navigational systems um, uh, here. So these inertial nav systems, as I mentioned, have a combination of, of gyroscopes and accelerometers that you can't see in them. Um, and we might want to combine that with the GPS type system. Uh, and what this is called is this whole field is known as state estimation. Um, and we have an example. So say the state is the position of car. Uh, and we want to know where is the car in the world. Um, and we have several different uh, systems on a car. So we have inertial. Um, and we, it's very fast, we could say. You can read the, the, this inertial system basically as fast as you want, you know, thousands of times per second. Um, but it has long-term drift. So the longer we run it, uh, the worse it gets. Over very short periods of time, over a few seconds, it's extremely accurate. Possibly over a few minutes, it's fairly accurate. Um, over hours or days, it's not accurate at all. Um, GPS, by comparison, is slower. Uh, it has short-term drift, but over the long term, it's extremely accurate. So it doesn't matter if you've run your GPS for you know, one hour or 20 hours, uh, the position fix is going to be a basically the same accuracy. Um, and we may also have something else like a speedometer, which you know, is accurate for speed only. Uh, so it's a, the problem is a few things. One, the, the different sensors are giving us different uh, types of readings. So the inertial sensors are giving us acceleration. Uh, the speedometer is giving us speed. The GPS is giving us actual position. And they all have different error terms. Uh, so how do you optimally combine these types of, of systems? Uh, one way is to use a Kalman filter. Uh, this is just a form of state estimation. All of these state estimation systems basically use uh, two steps. There's a prediction step uh, which predicts a new state. And what this means is that if I have my car, um, I can say, you know, I commanded it to drive at 20 miles an hour for four seconds. Uh, I can estimate, well, based on that, I know what the new position should be t without any sensors at all. Um, so if it was here, I now estimate it's going to be over here. Um, and I know this estimate isn't perfect. There's going to be errors involved in that. Uh, and this, this move, movement of the device, you know, you can set it up basically as a a matrix that says, you know, based on either the speed that I'm commanding, uh, the speed and the time, I know how, what the new position is. 
Um, and the position will be one of the things that we can directly measure. So what we're going to do then um, is use a measurement step which helps to refine what our actual position is. Um, and this, the, the idea of the Kalman filter is the measurement step lets you use both this estimated state um, and it also takes into account how much noise you expect to have on the various measurements. So the, uh, the GPS versus the accelerometer versus the gyro um, versus the speedometer. Uh, so it tries to optimally combine those various measurements. Um, oops. Nope. So the Cowan filter, to go through it's quite a bit of detail, um, but very briefly you simply have to know that you need this, uh, the prediction steps, you need to have some uh, model for your system, which in your robot you would for example, because you know based on the speed how far it's going to travel. Um, and you need to know some information about the, the sensors, which in your case you would. Uh, once you have that, it's just at this continuous case, um, so this is done iteratively, a continuous case of using the previous estimated value, applying the model to give us a, um, an estimate based on the control inputs, and then fixing that control inputs with the measurements to give us the best estimated state. Um, the other thing you'll probably run into is types of controllers, so fuzzy logic. Um, fuzzy logic is something where, you know, if we had an idea of, I think do I have a robot? Uh, if I had a robot that, you know, the objective of the robot is to get to this light source. What we might do with logic is we say read, so there's a left and right light sensor here. Um, and we say read those light sensors. If the left light sensor is greater than the right light sensor, um, what I want you to do is just turn this motor on. Um, and what it's going to do, it's going to tilt the robot that way and just keep tilting it until the right light sensor is more power, it has a stronger signal than the left, and turn the other motor on. And it'll just slowly work its way up. Um, this sort of is the idea of a classic Boolean just on-off logic. You could see the same thing with a, um, you know, an oven controller. You said if it's too cold, turn on the oven. If it's too hot, turn off the oven. Uh, so it's very much just on or off. Uh, that would be sort of a very classic, you know, just logic controller. So fuzzy logic, which is a tiny bit of a buzzword for some stuff you'll find, um, takes the idea of, well, rather than, you know, having this strict logic that tries to either just be on or off, or very, uh, you know, logic for every possible case state. Um, so logic to say, you know, if the light reads 97 on one degree and 54 on the other, do this. Um, the idea is to break down uh, things into fuzzy sets. And a fuzzy set just means that, you know, this temperature input here, rather than being 42 degrees Celsius and the humidity is 17%, um, all they've done is they said, well, we're just going to have three possibilities for the humidity. Humidity is low, humidity is medium, or humidity is high. Um, so the input to this is, you know, just medium. So at some point you have to convert because your sensors only give you numbers. Um, the fuzzy sets are, you know, your own construct and it depends on how many sets you want. Uh, so you'll have to sort of set up groups for that. So I can say that temperature is low and all it's going to say is in that case the fan speed is temperature is cool um, cool and medium so the fan speed is low and you can see the output is also just a fuzzy set so it's either off low medium or high um, it doesn't have a specific number so the, the general idea of fuzzy logic is just that we have these, you know, simple fuzzy sets uh, where we aren't using absolute values for things. We're, we've tried to make it very, you know, sort of generic. Um, the reasoning behind this is it's supposed to make the programming side a lot easier uh, since you don't have to figure out every possible case. You just, you know, take your variable, convert it to one of these, uh, this smaller fuzzy set, and it gives you a pretty good solution to the problem. Uh, so it's not calculating an absolute fan speed, you know, for based on the inputs in some equation. It's just doing approximately what you think looks right. Uh, 
a sort of quasi-fuzzy solution to the previous problem, to give you an idea of you can loosen the definitions if you want a bit, um, is to do something like this. So we have a the same light sensor, left and right. Um, and all we're going to do is we're going to take the, for example, the right light sensor. Um, and it might be that you need to, to take this value if it's between, you know, 1 and 255, and we're going to cut it down to be a smaller range of 0 to 16 or something. Uh, and we're just going to multiply it by some arbitrary constant. And whatever the output of that is, we're just going to feed into the, um, into the motor controller. So if the light on the left side is very bright, so if there's a lot of light going in, it's going to turn on the motor on the right side at a higher power. Um, and that's going to drive the robot towards the light. So this is a little nicer because with this solution, the motors were going to be continually turning on and off. It's very jerky. It's going to drive, stop, drive, stop, drive, stop. Um, with something like this, it's going to be a much more fluid movement towards the final light source. Uh, you don't, you know, A, the code itself has been made simpler, um, and B, it'll just sort of slowly inch its way towards that light source. You don't have this problem of, you know, jerking, uh, uh, turning on and off so suddenly. Turning on and off very suddenly, of course, in your little robot, the problem might be it might knock, you know, boards off it every time it stops if you have some stuff hastily mounted on, um, it could knock it off. So you may want to look towards using uh, what I call these quasi-fuzzy solutions. Uh, I say quasi-fuzzy because there's no fuzzy sets defined within them, um, so it's not a true fuzzy, fuzzy solution, I'm sure people would argue. Uh, but the basic idea is that rather than making very well-defined logical choices, um, we're sort of you know, using these these constants to say, well, take the reading. If the reading's high, make the motor go fast. If the reading's low, make the motor go slow. Um, so it's the mindset of the fuzzy problem. The interesting thing with that is we can also do stuff like even adding touch sensors right into this. Um, so say we have the same thing. We have these left and right um, light sensors. Uh, we also are going to have bumpers, so we can detect if we run into a, so these would be, have little switches in them, and those could be pieces of metal. So the idea is that if we hit a bumper anywhere, um, if we run into something, it's going to activate the switch on the left or right side. Uh, if we activate the switch on the left side, for example, Um, it's going to, and assume this, this output is just a zero or one is the bumper hit, um, it's going to put this minus 100, which is going to force the left motor to drive backwards. And, you know, we've done this without any real logic uh, in this entire solution. So it's still, you know, uh, it's still going to have a, a, bit of a, a bit of a positive offset that the, this minus 100 will overcome. Uh, in this, you know, right, if there's a light sensor. Uh, so this is where we get into the point that it's not a, you know, a true logical solution here. We've just sort of, you know, fudged things such that it'll mostly work and you would need a time delay such that it actually continues to dry back um, after the bumpers hit. Uh, but this sort of solution to a problem lets you avoid using, you know, very well-defined logic and instead use this idea of, well, I'm just going to take rough uh, measurements and, you know, if there's a a bumper hit, I'm going to drive back a bit. Um, not some specific speed, because the speed will depend on the inputs. Um, and this is sort of the idea of the, the, fuzzy, the fuzzy controller, is that, again, we're, we're trying to remove very structured logic and just give it this idea of, you know, if there's a bit of light, drive faster. If I hit something, drive back. Um, so that's the general idea that you might find useful in fuzzy controllers. Um, there's also a, there's, what are they called? I forget if they call it a fuzzy compiler or something, but this JFuzzy logic, uh, it's basically a GUI that you can set up fuzzy sets in and they play around a bit with. So if you're interested in them, you can download that. Um, it's, you know, a pretty good resource and it has a lot of examples of true fuzzy logic controllers, but it might give you some more ideas as well. All right. Um, another thing, 
you may run into ever so often is uh, neural networks. Um, so what are neural networks? They're basically a form of pattern recognition. Um, pattern recognition being we have some input, oops. we have some known input uh, and we have some known output. So for example, people try to use these for sort of like magical things, you know, the stock market, how some stocks are doing and if it's a sunny day and I'm trying to correlate if there's a pattern between the two. Um, the idea being that you just give the neural network combinations of inputs and outputs um, and it learns any pattern, if there's any associated pattern between the two. Um, you have no idea if there is, you don't understand what it's looking at. You just push it all to the neural network to figure this out. Uh, there's sort of a few caveats here. You, you know, they're not magic, there has to be an underlying pattern. Uh, so you can't use them for lottery number prediction uh, or stock number prediction, which is they were really popular because people thought they would be magic more or less and they fell out of favor because they didn't do that well. Um, basically for this reason, uh, it also requires a very diverse training set, which is to say that if you have a model of a system, using a neural network is not a good idea. Um, if you already know, you know, there's, there is a correlation between A and B and I have a rough idea what it is, uh, to get that same level of accuracy out of the neural network, you're going to need a training set that has you know, a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs. The problem being that it'll learn the wrong pattern. Um, so if you, know, you, you train your neural network entirely for image recognition and you're doing it um, entirely on a sunny day, it may fail when it's a you know, cloudy day because it's never seen a cloudy day. It hasn't developed uh, the pattern matching logic to say, I need to you know, recognize these different images in uh, both cloudy and sunny conditions. Um, the real issue being, let's go to an example. Uh, if you're using a neural network, so say I was trying to do pattern recognition uh, or you know, handwriting recognition. So I say, here is an H um, as an input to the neural network. And I say, you know, H. And I'm going to give it a bunch of different examples of ways people might draw H. So I'll do this, I'll do that, um, and uh, different types of H's. And it'll learn, you know, all of these different patterns mean this single output. Um, the problem is that what I could do is all my training sets, for example, could use these neurons here or use these letters here. So I'm, I'm just overlaying all the various training sets. Um, you know, so I have 16 different H examples, but I've only drawn it on this left half here. Um, if I later come along and try to use the neural network and put an input in right here, uh, it will probably fail because my training set didn't include that. It wasn't diverse enough. It, it only ever looked at H's on the left side of that input pad. Um, so it will say, oh, that's, I have no idea what that is. I've never seen anything remotely like that in my life. Um, and it's because I needed to draw it over here. Uh, I needed to draw it where I did my training. Uh, so to fix this issue, my training set should have you know, H's all over the place, different scale sizes. Um, so how we would use them is that basically they have this idea. Uh, they use the idea of you know, sort of a human, they're modeled roughly after biological um, neural networks. Oops. And we have a number of, so there's a number of input nodes, they call them. Um, so there's these three inputs here. Uh, and there's a number of outputs. And in between sort of where the magic happens. So going back to this example, uh, what each of these inputs would be, I would s literally just make each pixel maybe an input. And you know, you just have a whole bunch of connections. So each pixel is an input. Um, and then the output would depend on what I want the neural network to learn. So if I was trying to do this idea of handwriting recognition, um, I could just make each output A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. Um, so there's going to be the 26 output nodes, and there'd be however many pixels there are <laughs> input nodes. Um, and all I would do is I would say, you know, well, I'm going to train you for A. So I'll draw an A here. Um, in, in this case, there's definitely not enough resolution for this to work, so let's make this bigger. I draw an A here, um, and each of these inputs could just be, you know, either the percentage 
it may just be one or zero. So maybe one if there's a uh, a input in that pixel. So it would just be one, 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 one. So this is how I'd convert to a neural network. Um, and then the other input nodes are zero. Um, and as part of the training, I would say what I want you to output is a one for A and zero for everything else. Uh, and you know that's one of my training sets. And I would need hundreds of these training sets each time saying A is one. Um, when it goes to run in real life, what I'm going to get is, you know, I'll put in some value here, and it might say, well, I'm, you know, the A output is 0.8, whatever, 7, B is 0.1, something, etc. cetera. Uh, so it'll then try to replicate based on the, the new pattern it sees. Um, it'll try to replicate that training set I gave it where I said, make A as high as possible, everything else as low as possible. So that's the general idea behind what neural networks are doing. Um, and as I say, they have this idea that we have input nodes. So in the, that previous example, each input node was a pixel. We have output nodes, and it's, you know, it's up to you how many output nodes you have, depending on what you're using them for. Um, and in between, we have what are called these hidden nodes. And these hidden nodes are just interconnections between all of the inputs and all of the outputs. And there can be multiple layers of hidden nodes, you know, to get thousands of neurons if you want, um, or more. So, but, and they work fairly well. So this was sort of an example from a project I did. So I had a hovercraft, and I was experimenting with using a neural network to drive it around. Uh, so hovercrafts are somewhat more interesting because, you know, if you want to turn, you have to try turning ahead a little bit um, because they're slow to do the turn. It's not like a robot where you just say turn and it immediately reacts. Um, and in this case, the, the hovercraft itself, it was, I believe this was a neural network here. Um, so it just had this, this very simple neural network and uh, this neural network had as an input, I think, do I show a photo? Yeah, uh, as an input, it had distance, which is distance to the obstacle. Uh, in front of it, and that was just using a uh, ultrasonic transducer there. Right there. Um, as well as having two outputs, and, and the outputs were just propulsion speed and uh, how much to churn. So one of these was speed, and one of them was churn. Um, so, what the rudder should be set to basically, or yeah, what the rudder should be set to is churn, and uh, speed was just how fast that rear motor should spin. Uh, so that's this motor here, was the speed motor, you can see. Um, and then there's some other stuff, so similar to your robots, it uses, you know, pulse width modulation uh, to drive the, the different motors, um, it has some additional logic in there. Yeah, so how the neural network actually works is each of these connections between the different nodes has an associated weight with it. Um, here. And this weight, you know, is just some number, 0 0.127, 127, something like that. Um, and all it does is each neuron uh, does a combination of a summation of all the inputs and passing an activation function. Now, if these are the weights, one, two, seven, six, I'm just making up numbers here. Um, and you could just say it is like, that's weight one, weight two, weight three. Um, so this summation is just a sum of the input, input I with weight I. Um, and the input just being whatever that other, other node's value was. Oops. Back here. Uh, so that's, you know, this distance measurement is just propagated to each of these intermediate nodes. Um, then the output of the intermediate nodes is propagated to the, the output node, and it does that summation, um, again, applying the weight to each path in the branch. 
Uh, the other thing it does, and this is sort of what makes the neural network really work, is there's some activation function, they call it. Um, the activation function oops, is basically just a nonlinear function. Um, normally, anyway, they, they work the best. So there's a variety of options here. You can use linear. Um, I use this logistic function, which is just an uh, exponent, uh, as you can see here. So it gives you this output, uh, approximate output. So this is the input here, and the output on the y-axis. Um, and this is what gives you the basically the entire neural network, is this really simple summation of the input, the activation function, and then propagates it on the outputs. Um, you know, and this was just showing through the, for the neural network I was using, what were the final weights? So somehow encoded in these weights and the activation function is the, uh, the functionality that I was looking for. So that's the downside of the neural network is I don't really know, you know there's no way to look at these numbers and say, oh, here's the logic it's performing. Um, it's solely performing whatever I trained it to do. Uh, now, as the training example, um, here, this is what I use to tell the neural network, here's, you know, here's how I want you to respond. Um, so this was pulled directly from the training file, so it looks a little crazy, but there's basically a distance here. Um, and in this case, the distance is relative. Uh, so it says, and ignore the first row, um, it says, you know, if the object is really far away, um, so this point 0.1, oops, then the speed is at a maximum because we have quite a bit of time. Um, or no, actually, if the distance is very close, so we're point 0.1, uh, very close to us, the speed is the highest speed you can go and the turn is the furthest over. For a hovercraft, you would need that to do the fastest turn. Um, compared to, for example, if the object is very far away, I feel like these are backwards. The churn should be here, I think. If the object is very far away, so this is churn and then this is speed. Uh, if the object is very far away, so I have a one on the distance column, um, I don't want you to churn at all, so I have zero on the, the amount to churn. Um, and the speed is, you know, 0.9, so I'm going pretty fast. Uh, and in between, there's just various other examples. So if, as the object gets closer, uh, I might do a slower turn here and slow the speed down a bit so I don't slam into it. So I have some pattern that I've figured out that I want it to, to do. Um, and this is solely the example I give it. So I just give it these numbers here. Um, and then I can use it for any other input value I want. So if I now give it an input of 0 0.45, um, it will figure out what to do. And you know, it's not simply just interpolating between the two. In this case, maybe that would work. Um, but it's looking for if there's any underlying pattern. So this is a really simple example of the use of a neural network, you know, a very small neural network, something that you can easily run in your microcontroller. Uh, to solve a simple problem of figuring out, you know, how fast should I run a motor and uh, how much should I turn it. Uh, and that was done, the nice thing is I didn't really need uh, to write down a whole bunch of logic saying, you know, if this, do this, if this, do this. Once I set this up, um, I can simply run the training algorithm. So the training's done offline. Uh, what the training does is it simply fiddles with all those weight values. Um, so it's going to adjust all these weight values and this just runs in your computer uh, until the, the neural network gives you the desired outputs for these inputs that you've told it about. Uh, once it's locked those weight values in, you just download them and run with it. Um, so again, I don't need to know how it's figuring out what to do here. I just tell it, tell it the results I want and it does all the rest. Um, so that's sort of, sort of the interesting thing about the neural network. And of course, you can add additional logic on. In this example, you notice the churn is simply a magnitude. Uh, there's no negatives or anything like that here. So to make things simple, all I did was a separate piece of logic says, should I turn left or right? 
Um, I was using this solely for controlling the speed and the, uh, the turn servo uh, magnitude. And then the direction is done with other logic. Which I think is shown somewhere. Um, yeah, so there's churn detection logic, it calls it. It just says, should I go left or right based on where there's an opening? All right, so that's another thing you could use. Um, we're still good. So that's all logic for figuring out, you know, uh, how should I actually control the motor based on some inputs? What I haven't answered yet is still the question of how we know where we are in the world and you know how we get where we want to go. So this is another aspect of it. Um, and to answer this, we're going to use a bit of uh, mapping, or talk a little bit about mapping. Uh, so to talk about mapping, you'd have to understand how can I represent this map in the robot and make it use it. So I've given you this map here. Um, and what we can do is we can look at just a corner of it. So you could say, you know, I know my robot's starting here. And I want it to be able to find its way to the goal while also remembering not to run into obstacles or stuff like that. Um, you know, so you could just do this reactively where you say, well, I'm going to look for the tape border. And whenever there's tape here, I'm just not going to drive over it, which is good. That's a good technique. Um, but you may want more than that. You may want it to have some idea of what the best path is. Uh, so to do this, we'll have to represent the map uh, in our robot's memory. And we can do this with a digital representation. Um, so what I've done here is I've taken this map, and everywhere that the robot can't drive, as an example, I've assigned it the value 0. The actual value you assign it you know, can be whatever you want. Um, so let's say I'm going to assign that 0. And what you might do is you might set the goal to something else. So I might say this is, you know, Number 25 means the flag, um, number 8 means the coin, something like that. So I'm just, whatever the assignment of numbers are is up to you. Uh, the nice thing is once we have this, it can be converted to C code. Um, so I can just make a two-dimensional C variable and, you know, this whole top row of zeros is the first row of the array. Uh, the next row here, I've assigned 255 to mean empty space. Um, and you say it's 255, 255, 255, so all of these until it gets to, there's two obstacles here, and then a bunch of blank space, and then another obstacle. So the obstacle in this case means the edge of the, edge of the course that I don't want the robot to drive into. Uh, you also could have a separate number, so that these zeros here represent this fixed wall. Um, I could assign them a different number, so I could say, you know, you're two. Here, why this is useful, so why I have these different numbers and stuff like that, is that um, later on in my code, I can access this map. And I can just access it as a variable and index it to x and y. So if I know my robot's position, or I think I know the robot's position, I can say, you know, what should I expect 10 meters ahead of me? Um, and all that's going to give me is, if this gives me a 2, for example, I know that there should be a wall in front of me. Um, and you could validate that with your rangefinder sensor or something like that. If it returns a zero, um, it would tell me that, hey, there's one of these boundaries that you should not cross or bad things happen. Uh, so you, you don't want to drive towards it. You don't want to waste time driving towards it. Detecting it and say, oh, crap, drive backwards, turn, go forward. Um, the fastest way to navigate the course will be to use a map uh, to figure out where to go. Uh, within the course and not something you know drive around and run in it run into things or detect things that you shouldn't uh, be running over So one algorithm you can use is what's called the wavefront algorithm um, so this algorithm uh, Is there's sort of a good example that I've linked down below if you want to see and they also have C code uh, showing you how you could run this but Basically, I have the same idea. So I have a map, and again, this map is using zeros to mean walls. Um, I have a robot here, and you can again use a, a random, some number for the robot. It's just marked with R here. Um, and to apply the wavefront code, I'm going to start at the upper left node here. And this, this algorithm just goes through node by node. And 
everything is gonna deal with boundary nodes. So a boundary node means that, you know, if I'm looking at this node right here, um, all of the boundary nodes are the nodes just around it, as you would sort of expect based on the name. Um, so if all the boundary nodes are walls, we just ignore, um, ignore the node and we'll just continue the algorithm. Um, and if the boundary node is the robot location and has a number assigned to it, it means we will have found our path. And you'll sort of see what all this means when I go through the example. Um, if the boundary node has a goal, we're gonna mark that node with the number three, so this is where the numbers come in, and then we'll continue the algorithm. Um, if the boundary node has already been marked with a number, then we're going to just keep incrementing that number, and this incremental number will give us our path. And eventually, we hope we find the robot location, and we have a, um, a series of numbers we can follow to get to our goal. So let me give you an example. So going back to this, I'm going to say my goal is right here. Um, so this is where I want my robot to go. I want it to go from where it is to that goal. And uh, to apply the wavefront code, I'm just gonna, as I mentioned, we start at the top and we just, we look down. So we start here and we just keep going down. Uh, we do nothing in this first row. It's all just uh, empty. It's all just walls, right? So we never did anything. Uh, this row, we're gonna go down now, and we now get to these empty nodes, but there's everything around it is just a wall, or there's no goal in it. There's nothing in it, so we just keep going down. Um, it only gets interesting, so once we go to get to this node right here, uh, we now have hit the logic that says, oops, uh, boundary node has a goal in it. So we're now gonna mark that node with a number three, uh, like this, and continue processing. Um, when we continue processing, the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, this node here uh, is adjacent to another number. It's adjacent to a three. So we're now gonna mark that node with a four, and this one with a five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, so this is the wavefront thing they call it, is because it, you know, start somewhere and just propagates downwards. Uh, and we're just gonna keep processing because we haven't found the robot. Remember, we keep processing until we run into the robot. Oops. Um, and in this case, we'll start going down this row, you know, nothing here. Once again, once we hit this node, there's a three in it. Uh, or we put a three in it because it's next to the goal. That's just the magic number we're putting there. Um, we continue processing, continue processing. Uh, here, we again have found a node that's next to a, uh, a numbered node, so we increment that number, so we'll put an eight in it. And finally, we will have found the robot, but let's load this now. Um, and finally, we found the robot. At this point, all we tell the robot to do is we say, hey, is there a number? Do you have a, a number anywhere around you that you can get to? Um, if you do, it means you now have a path option. Uh, all you do is count downward. So look at where you are and say, what's the lowest number you can drive to? Drive to that number. So drive to eight. You know, once it's at eight, drive to seven. Once it's at seven, etc. cetera. Um, so from where it started, you know, it could have alternatively driven this way, and that would have also given you a solution. Um, both of them would, will get you to the goal. Uh, so that's sort of the wavefront uh, method. If, and if, for example, this was blocked here, you went to got all this. Uh, you would have hit the robot, and there would be no path because it was blocked that way, um, and it would just continue processing. You'd then get a three here, and then it would go four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Um, you'd continue processing. Well, we we can fill it in because what will happen is we'll process here, and we'll say hey nine, um, ten, eleven. Uh, and eventually you loop back around. So one of the steps is you loop back, you keep looping through this until the whole matrix is full of numbers um, or has been visited at least. So, and eventually what you'll end up with is you'll get a nine here, a 10 here, um, and you'll again have this, um, this system and it'll loop again. And finally you'll reach the robot and say, hey, I've reached the robot, there's a number here, and I can just count downwards 
uh, to get to my goal. Um, so this sort of this counting down system will always give you a nice path to the goal. And that's one method of using, you know, a, if you have a map and you have a final goal you want to get to, uh, to figure out a solution to which way you should turn, rather than just doing simply, oh, running, try running into stuff. Um, yeah, so navigation. So there's a lot of options for navigation. Um, don't get overloaded. So there, I've given you a lot of things to consider. So having a robust solution is more important than you know some really complicated solution. Um, the use of magnetic compasses, and I'll show you this when I turn off the, uh, the microphone. It might be useful. You'll need to experiment on your surface. And why I say this is because uh, the magnetic compasses will have a, uh, an issue in that any metal near them will disrupt the measurement. Your motors turning on and off will disrupt the measurements, depending where you put it. Um, and the use of the accelerometer, and again, this is something I'll show you live, will be useful for um, bump detection. So let me plug this in. Okay. So what I have, I have the accelerometer that you have in your kit here. Uh, and it's wired up to the board again. This is what you'll see in the lab, so you'll have code for using it. Um, and what you're going to see uh, is there'll be a number of numbers on the screen and the numbers will represent the accelerometer, gyro, and magnetic field sensor. So if I connect the device, uh, what it's doing, let me just reboot it. All right. Uh, so there's a number of readings on the screen. The leftmost reading, so these three here, oops, I'll stop. Uh, these three are the X, Y, and Z acceleration readings. And uh, what you can see with this is that um, in the Z, so we have X, Y, and Z. In the Z, you see this huge number on the accelerometer. Uh, this is because that's the gravity vector. Um, the next three readings are the uh, gyro. Uh, these are all unitless. These are raw from the device, so they don't directly mean anything. Uh, you can convert them to degrees per second if you want, or you know, for the for the gyroscope, um, or meters per second squared, or whatever you want to use for the accelerometer. Um, so these are the gyro again, X, Y, Z. As I rotate it, you'll see those change. The final one is the magnetic field sensor, uh, which is what you would use to detect the Earth's magnetic field for making a compass. Um, so you'll see you know, three readings there. In this case, you could again convert them to, I think, like micro Tesla it's using, it can use internally. Um, but you don't really care because we care more about the ratio between them. Um, so looking first at the accelerometer here, uh, you can see, for example, if I take the device and I rotate it um, 90 degrees-ish, what you see is now the y-axis has the large reading because that's detecting the gravity vector. Um, so this, these changes are how we detect changes in you know, pitch and roll. Um, so you can see how it goes from being almost entirely in the z-axis to being almost entirely in the y-axis. And if I rotate it again, it should go to mostly the z-axis. Um, so that's just the constant acceleration due to gravity. Uh, so the other things we can detect, if I sort of move this around, you'll see larger numbers. I'll put it on the desk so it's moving in just one axis. Uh, and you can see these spikes in the acceleration due to me you know, going from at rest to moving it forward. Uh, the other thing you can detect is that if I sort of uh, bump this, you might see, and it depends right now because I'm just polling. Uh, you can set this up to give you an indication when a large uh, signal has happened. But if I you know, drive forward and run into something, uh, there'll be a large spike or a change. Oops. Uh, so you saw there was one reading all of a sudden that had a you know, like 7,000 in the X column. Uh, and that's because I was driving forward and then ran into something. Uh, so again, in this case, because you can see that plus 4,000, because I'm just polling this ever so often, it's very easy for me to miss 
uh, these readings. I should either pull it faster, this is only every 500 milliseconds, um, done that way just to make it easier for you to, uh, you to see them come by. When you're running this uh, in your device, you don't need to worry about uh, you know, being able to print it like that. You can just use the raw readings. All right, so that's the accelerometer. Uh, the gyro, so again, we have X, Y, Z, and it's in between the hash signs, uh, so you have to sort of ignore the other stuff. As I spin the device, um, what you'll see is that the X column, I'm just rotating it on the table, so this is the X axis. Uh, you can see it's you go going negative something. If I rotate it the other way, it goes positive some larger number. And I can do this faster or slower. Um, so the, the limit is around like, is, it's a 16-bit number, so plus minus 32768. Um, so you can see it, with a moderately fast rotation, I can get pretty high up there. Uh, the chip itself has multiple ranges you can select between, so I'm just using one of the ranges here. Um, but you can use this to detect, you know, is your robot actually rotating? And I can move this up and down. So as I rotate it around in free space, you can see all of the axes changing. Um, the final thing is the... Uh, the X, Y, and Z for the magnetic field sensor. Um, and again, we have the same deal, X, Y, Z. And what you should see is that as I rotate this, uh, you'll see changes mostly in the X and Y. And this is as the, uh, the magnetic field vector is changing between. So what we're seeing happen is uh, we have the, you know, we have the X here, Y, um, and we have a magnetic field vector that is some constant. Um, so the magnetic field vector is constant. Our X and Y axes are actually rotating uh, because our, our robot's rotating. And uh, we see different amounts of this vector projected onto the, you know, if the X axis was in line with the field, it will be entirely in the X direction. If the y-axis was in line with the uh, magnetic field, it would be entirely in the y-direction. And I might be able to get that. Come on. There we go. Um, Yeah, so you can see, let's see if I can rotate this the right way. Uh, so if you rotate it the right way, at some point, oh, there we're getting close. Uh, it's gonna be entirely in one axis. Um, and if I rotate it about 90 degrees, what I would expect to see, that's about 90 degrees, um, is the reading will change sort of hard to get it. So you can see previously in the, uh, the Y axis, it's around zero. And then if I rotate it in the vicinity of 90 degrees, uh, the Y axis now <laughs> becomes a much larger uh, component of it. And I can go about 180 from that. And we should start to see it decrease again. Um, so it takes a little playing around with the sensor as well as the configuration of it. Uh, the one issue, and so this is what I sort of mentioned, is if I just have it sitting here, if I bring something metal, so I'll use my mouse. Oh, that wasn't a good idea. Uh, if I bring a, you know, this large metal microphone near the sensor, uh, what you'll see is the readings will probably start to go a little crazier. Um, I don't know how close we'll have to get. So there you can see the, uh, the readings have changed drastically. You know, it went from, uh, you know, it's varying around 5 or 12, um, up to like 20 in the Z axis, uh, depending on how close I get here, 47, 41. So metal is going to affect it drastically because it's uh, the magnetic field is being deformed as the metal gets near. So that's something that you can compensate to some degree, but if you want to use the compassing feature, you'll have to mount it uh, away from any strong magnetic fields. Oops. So I think that was sort of the, uh, the other demo I wanted to show you. Are there any questions on either the sensor or the navigational stuff?
Um, as I mentioned, the lab on Monday and the lecture Monday will talk a little bit more um, about details of using that. Three yet. Uh, if you haven't done the first, the first problem is asking you to write a C program uh, to generate some frequency of square wave uh, on port B pin for the development board. Um, so how do we do this? And it tells you what timer to use. Um, and I just wanted to give you an idea of where these frequencies come from and how you um, uh, how you deal with that. So the the first thing it's it's talking about is this idea of a prescaler. Um, and what this is looking at is if you look in your AVR data sheet, um, timer counter zero. Uh, so the timer block itself um, takes a, where is it? Uh, so it takes the clock from the external clock source and divides it down by some amount. Um, and there's a lot of options you can use here. So let's go back. Uh, and if you look down, eventually it'll talk about the configuration of the timer. Um, I talk a little bit about this. The lab I reference will go through, you know, how you actually set all this stuff. I don't want to give you an idea of what the heck it is. Um, so if you look through, eventually it'll have a list of the prescaler settings. Just close this stuff. Oh no. Uh, so if I go back to timer zero, sorry. Um, and it talks a bit about the clock sources. Uh, and it says you can take it from a prescaler. So what those settings are is down in the register setting somewhere. Um, it has all these, come on. Here it is. Um, so basically what that part of the question is telling you is that I want you to use this, uh, the external clock divided by 256. Um, so what this means for you is that your clock to the device is this, uh, what is it, 14.7456. Uh, so that's the input clock. So I'm going to divide that. The, the timer system is simply going to divide it by uh, 256, uh, which will give you this clock of 0 0.0576. So uh, what this means is you now have a 57.6 kilohertz clock. Um, so that's the input clock. That's really the input clock to your timer. Uh, and the next thing you'll have to think about is, is this um, somehow related to this 1.152 kilohertz clock? Um, what did I say? So I now want you to use this, this 57.6 kilohertz clock to generate you know, some other arbitrary frequency I've de defined here. Um, and, oops, I don't need that, do I? And you can ask yourself, you know, what's the relation here? Uh, and if you're lucky, it works out that it's exactly uh, 50. So you'll be able to use uh, some of the timer functions to further divide that down. And what this is really going to be is that um, we have this, you know, this 57.6 kilohertz clock, or let me go down here. Um, and to generate a one point whatever kilohertz clock, um, you're going to have to count, you know, 50 cycles of this to toggle your pins on. Um, so the, the timer system has an ability to adjust uh, when it's toggling the outputs. And I think, do I give you the hint there? Uh, yes, yeah, so with clear timer on compare mode. Um, 
So there is a, where's the data sheet? So there's a system here where when the, the timer reaches some value, uh, it resets the timer. And when it reaches that value, it toggles one of the output pins. Um, so what you'll want to look at is the, where is it? Well, a few things. You'll, you'll want to look at this CTC mode. Um, this is what is, is the clear timer on compare mode. So this tells you about setting some of the pins or some of the bits within the AVR. Here. Um, and what it's telling you is that if you set some of these bits up as given in this table, um, the timer the timer clears when it, uh, it reaches some value that you specify. And you specify this value in this other register, output compare register A. Um, so this is where you have to write, you know, when I talk about, okay, well, every 50 clocks or every 25 clocks or whatever it is you figure it out, um, the timer clears. And when it clears, it's just going to toggle a pin. Uh, so you may have to experiment a little bit with, or think a, bit, a little bit of if you should be setting this to 50 or 25, um, but you can always test this on a scope. And when the timer resets, so it's going to count up to whatever you set and then reset back to zero. Uh, when it resets, there's an option somewhere to, uh, what you want to do, and here we go. So you'll, you'll want to look at these uh, compare output modes, so this is not in pulse width modulation mode. And one of these options is toggle OC0B on compare match. Uh, and if you can guess what OC0B is or OC0A, so there's different options you'll have to look at. Um, so toggle OC0A on compare match. Uh, one of these pins. Yeah, so there we go, toggle on. One of these two pins will actually. B. Uh, so when you look at the AVR pinout, it says use uh, port B pin 4. Uh, and if you look at port B pin 4 on the, the data sheet, what you see is that port B pin 4 has a bunch of features. One of it is this output compare 0 B. Uh, so basically what you have to do is you've got to set uh, this OC 0 B output compare for timer 0. B, uh, to toggle on the compare match, you have to set the compare match up to the right value, and if you have to set your timer to, the, um, to that mode, the clear timer on compare match mode. So that's a little hint for the first question, um, because we did talk a little bit about timers, but I want to give you an idea of where to look within the data sheet, um, so you don't just get totally lost about it. Uh, but yeah, but if there's more questions, you can always post in the form, ideally.